Despite being blessed with massive natural sources of water flowing down from the Himalayas, Pakistan is the fourth largest user of groundwater after India, the United States, and China. This massive and ongoing groundwater extraction feeds the country's economically critical agriculture sector. Yet all of this pumping is also unsustainable. The Pakistan groundwater situation threatens the country's water, food, and energy security. In this video, we're going to talk a little bit about the groundwater over in Pakistan. But first, the Asianometry newsletter. Check out the newsletter to read the entire scripts for previously released videos, including those you might not have seen before, along with some additional commentary. The sign-up link is in the video description below. I try to put one out every week, maybe two. All right, back to the show. Let us start off with Pakistan's water profile. The country owns significant water resources, but how those resources are allocated and used is complicated. Pakistan's weather is rather arid. More than 75% of its rainfall comes during the monsoon season. The rest of the year, the weather is extremely dry, leading to higher than normal evaporation. The most significant surface water supply in the country is the Indus River. One of the world's biggest rivers, it crosses several countries and drains into an area of over 450,000 square miles. Unfortunately, Pakistan has to share this river with a number of other countries, most significantly India. The partition of India in 1947 majorly divided the river, as well as its associated irrigation systems, and led to a significant water dispute the year after. It was not until 1960 that the two countries signed the Indus Water Treaty mediated by the World Bank. Pakistan received water from three western rivers, the Jalum, Chenab, and Indus rivers. These rivers together provide about 170 to 180 billion cubic meters of water each year on average. Nearly 96% of Pakistan's renewable water sources come from this single river system. These rivers in turn depend on snow and ice melt from western Himalayan glaciers for some 50 to 80% of its water. It is kind of amazing to think about how so many of Asia's major rivers depend on the Himalayas for water. Anyway, this treaty created peace, but it has also indirectly led to over-exploitation of Pakistan's groundwater. Before we can continue, we should first discuss groundwater. When most people hear the word groundwater, they generally conjure up fantasies of water sloshing around in cavern lakes and rivers deep under the ground. But that's fantasy, not reality. The reality is that most groundwater exists in pores within the rock and soil. All rocks have pores, but some rocks are more permeable than others, like sandstone, which is basically a rock made out of sand. The deeper we go beneath the surface, the more water we find in those pores. A rock with its pores entirely filled is saturated. When we drill a hole into that rock, the water leaves its old home within the rock's pores and enters the hole. This happens until the water reaches a constant level. The level at which this happens is called the water table. When water hits the ground, it moves downward through the soil and subsoil to the underlying rock. If the rock is permeable, then it keeps going until it hits and joins the water table. This is groundwater recharge. Water and groundwater, in particular, is very important to Pakistan because so many of its 220 million people are farmers. Pakistan is the world's 8th largest food producing country. Over 95% of total water extractions, including 85% of its extracted groundwater, is used for agriculture. This is far higher than the global average of about 40%. Some 40-45% to of Pakistan's entire labor force directly depend on agriculture to earn a living. Though Pakistan has in many ways transitioned into being a services economy, Agriculture still generates 18-22% to of the country's GDP and 60% of its foreign exchange. Pakistan grows a great deal of things, like chickpeas, apples, onions, tangerines, and such, but 75% of the area is cultivated for just four very water-thirsty crops, wheat, rice, sugarcane, and cotton. Many of Pakistan's aforementioned industrial and services economies depend on these agricultural outputs. For instance, sugar mills, rice huskers, and of course, textiles. This heavy reliance on these water-thirsty cash crops has a bit of interesting history behind it. What began as a way to feed the masses eventually turned into a critical economic policy tool. During the 1960s, President Ayub Khan 
invited the Green Revolution to come to Pakistan. If you're not entirely familiar with the Green Revolution, it involves the work of Dr. Norman Borlaug, who believed that genetically manipulated food crops like rice and grain can save the world from mass hunger. New fertilizers and highly productive strains of crops, including the Mexipac strain of wheat, were an immediate hit. In 1959 to 1960, Pakistanis had produced just 801 kilograms of wheat per hectare. In 1996 and 1997, Pakistani yields more than doubled up to 2,026 kilograms per hectare. Similar things happened for rice, and their plentiful bounties filled up the national grain silos. Rightfully so, the Green Revolution is often credited for helping Pakistan avoid a recurrence of famines that occurred in the mid-1960s and has also allowed the country to slowly but steadily grow its per capita income even as the country's population exploded from 40 or so million in 1959 to 140 million in 1996 to 220 million today. An incredible achievement. But remember, Dr. Borlaug envisioned the Green Revolution as a way to help feed the hungry masses. It was never designed as a golden path to national wealth, but that was what Pakistan used it for. The ruling Pakistani government came to power on a somewhat contradictory political agenda. The land ownership situation in both India and Pakistan after World War II was like many other countries in Asia, vastly unequal. The rural poor worked land they did not own, unable to generate wealth. The government's founding party, the Muslim League, won their support by promising to eradicate rural poverty. And how would be the best way to pull off such a thing? Governments in Taiwan and South Korea did a land-to-the-tiller program that expropriated excess agricultural land from the landlords and gave it to the tenant farmers. In other words, land reform. Land reform would be the obvious thing to do. However, it was not possible in Pakistan due to promises made to the landlords. To win the support of the landlords in the Punjab, Sindh, and Baluchistan provinces, the Pakistan government offered them political power. So now you have this tricky situation. How do you improve the lot of the rural tenant farmers without land reform? Thusly, the government invited the Green Revolution as a way to grow itself out of this problem, literally and economically. What started off as a way to feed the masses has turned into, for better or worse, an economic engine. Pakistan's national economic growth is closely tied to its agricultural growth. Such a system requires a massive irrigation system. As I mentioned, the treaty guaranteed Pakistan's use of three rivers in the Indus Basin. The country promptly began construction on a vast network of 12 inter-river canals, 23 barrages, and three major dams to harness those waters for irrigation. This system is called the Indus Basin Irrigation System, or IBIS. Stretching over 57,000 kilometers, it is one of the world's largest integrated irrigation systems. Altogether, it diverts about 75% of Pakistan's allocated water flow. The gravity-run irrigation system delivers a predetermined amount of water to farmers based on how much land they own, as well as what water is available to deliver. Unfortunately, the system's delivery efficiency is very poor. About 60-70% to 70 of the river's water is wasted. This is in part due to leakages, a high rate of evaporation, and vast underpricing. Canal water is priced at just a fifth of its actual operating cost. As a result, the system carries an amount of water equivalent to only 30 days of river runoff, or about 9% of the system's total available water. This is in comparison to irrigation systems in other countries. 900 days for the Colorado and Murray-Darling rivers, 500 days for the Orange River in South Africa, and so on. The irrigation system's shortcomings have forced Pakistani farmers to find new sources of water. Unable to fulfill their needs from the surface, they have in turn looked downwards. Pakistanis have been drilling water wells into the ground for thousands of years. The Greeks documented examples of horizontal wells in the province of Baluchistan as far back as 2,500 years ago. But in 1960, on the eve of the Indus Water Treaty, most of the country's water usage came from the surface. For instance, in the Punjab province, groundwater was just 8% of farmer water supply. Certain government policies would change this. Pakistan is a very flat country, with poor natural drainage. When the country floods, as it might often happen, 
the water has nowhere to go but down into the ground. This raises the water table dangerously close to the surface. A high water table, in turn, causes the soil to become heavily saturated with water, a situation called waterlogging. This hurts most crops for two reasons. First, it blocks air from getting to the roots of plants. Most major cash crops, with the exception of rice, die when their soils become waterlogged. Second, waterlogging raises the amount of salt in the soil. Groundwater tends to be mineralized and a little salty. As it rises towards the surface, it evaporates in the heat, leaving salt behind. And, as a folklorist might testify, salt in the earth is never a great thing. The Pakistan government has long sought solutions to fix the waterlogging issue and help its rural farmers. In 1912, the Punjab government closed canals, planted eucalyptus groves, built storm drains, and lined canals. None of this really worked. So, starting in 1954 and then really ramping up in the 1960s, the government introduced in several provinces a new crash program called the Salinity Control and Reclamation Project, or SCARP. These involved digging some number of tube wells in the country's salinity-affected areas to pump up groundwater. The exact number is a bit unclear, anywhere like 15,000 to 20,000. These are small, electrically-powered tube wells pumping water from 40 to 120 meters deep. The government set up and promoted the SCARP program as a measure to control rising water tables. It seems to have largely done that in most areas. Pleased with the results, the government also realized that groundwater could help expand the country's total cultivated land. So starting in the 1970s, they encouraged farmers to drill with cheap loans for tube wells, free pump sets, and most critically, subsidized power to run these machines. In the Punjab and Sindh provinces, electricity charges for tube wells were 40% less than the normal rate. In the Baluchistan province, it was 60%. Nobody in the government apparently thought much about groundwater or aquifer supplies. Hardly anyone was even measuring these levels. The SCARP monitoring organization only measured groundwater levels within SCARP areas, not outside of it. This program succeeded, perhaps a little too much. Private landowners started drilling for groundwater all over the place. In the Punjab province, the irrigated area almost doubled from 8.6 million hectares in 1960 to 16 million in 2018. In the late 1980s, the government withdrew all public support except for the power subsidy. By the early 1990s, it was estimated that there were over 400,000 unregulated tube wells across the Indus Plains. Drought periods accelerate drilling. During one such drought from 1996 to 2001, surface water supplies in the Punjab province declined by 46%. Accordingly, the number of privately owned tube wells increased by 59%. Overpumping causes the water table to decline. In Baluchistan, during the early 2000s, the amount of decline was about 2 to 3 meters a year. 5 to 15% of its cultivated areas saw water tables dropping beyond their drillable ranges. The farmers, in turn, bring in bigger, more powerful engines so that they can drill deeper. Simple electric motors gave way to locally manufactured, high-speed diesel engines called peters. The cycle continues. Today, there are some 800,000 to 1.2 million private tube wells operating across Pakistan. And despite some improvements made to surface water supplies, the country uses more groundwater than ever before. This is in part due to the country's rather wasteful water usage habits. In 2017, Pakistan ranked near the bottom in water productivity, producing just $1.40 per cubic meter of water withdrawn. By comparison, Malaysia produced $55 per cubic meter of water withdrawn, China $21, and Turkey $13.60. Some 85% of the country's farmers are small and unsophisticated, mostly producing food for themselves or their livestock. The Green Revolution helped raise their food yields but those hit limits in the 1990s. Pakistani farmers lack education and, more importantly, financial resources to invest in better growing methods. Despite providing 20% of the country's GDP, the farm sector contributes less than 0.1% of the country's tax revenues. As a result, the yields on their thirstiest crops – wheat, sugarcane, rice, and so on – trail their cohorts in China or the United States. So, Pakistanis use more water to grow fewer crops than their counterparts, and it barely makes enough money for them to get by. 
I know that this is a bit of a strange topic to pick in light of the recent tragic news in Pakistan of massive floods. It is true that the monsoon floods will do a whole lot to recharge the aquifers. Depending on the area, they can add about 0.2 meters to even 0.6 meters of groundwater per season. Recharging is never as fast as withdrawal. But the ground can only absorb so much water all at once, and floods notwithstanding, groundwater withdrawals continue to outpace recharges. Without water pricing and supply reforms, overall water demand will continue marching ever higher. Certain areas are already suffering from water scarcity. Just 36% of the population has access to safe and reliable drinking water. And because so much water is for growing food, water shortages eventually lead to food shortages for the country's most vulnerable people. You need to rebuild the Indus system's crumbling irrigation infrastructure. You need to educate and loan farmers money so that they can adopt new, more water-efficient systems like drip or sprinkler integration. And you have to reprice water to its true value so people can start using it more efficiently, while at the same time stamping out corruption. Organizations like the Water Mafia are infamous. Yet all of this requires financial resources. In a country already struggling from a debt crisis, Finding the money to do all of this is a hard ask. And so, the country keeps on pumping. Alright, that's it for tonight. Thanks for watching. Subscribe to the channel, sign up for the newsletter, and I'll see you guys next time.